how to become an entomologist. How do I start? <laughs> start with like collecting and IDing. Stay curious and keep asking questions and pursuing answers. Entomology does not have a face, does not have a class, does not have a race. There is space in entomology for everybody. Hello, my dapper, intelligent, creative, and curious love bugs. Thank you so much for joining me for another video. And today we are going to be answering some of, but not all of your questions about how to become an entomologist. This I found out is going to be a three part series because you guys not only had a lot of questions that I thought were really good and there are a bunch that I definitely wanted to make sure that we answered, but also I wanted to answer them in a way that was fulfilling and really kind of helped you. So I broke this video up into three different parts. Part one today is just kind of general, how to get started as an entomologist, kind of like just general entomologist questions. And then part two is specifically tips and tricks and avoiding the mistakes I made in grad school. So you can pick and get a grad school that works for you. And the third one is all about jobs and other career paths in entomology. So without further ado, make sure you watch this video all the way to the end because not only are there some amazing questions in here that I think would be really helpful for you guys, but also I have paired your questions with advice from other entomologists, not just me and my opinion. So that way you get a well-rounded answer and also you get to hear some advice from from some very established entomologists as well. So I changed up our scenery today. I'm on my couch, I'm just like hanging out in my t-shirt because like, you know, it's just us. We're just gonna talk today because that's, that's what's great about YouTube is that you can connect with experts and that we can have these conversations with each other. So let's get into it. I'm going to be reading the questions off of my computer. <laughs> So I don't mince words and I don't butcher what you try to write me. So our first question comes from Mac and he asks, what are the benefits of being an entomologist? I think it depends on why you got into entomology. If you're looking to be rich and famous, I mean, probably you're not becoming an entomologist. There are some career paths that are slightly more lucrative than others, but for the most part, we get into entomology because we love bugs and we want to study them. For me, some of the benefits are that a, I have a lot of freedom. Look, I'm a tour guide and I get to claim that I'm an entomologist because I'm focusing my tourism on insects. So I really love the freedom that's available because there's so many insects, 1.2 million, and so many different directions you can take entomology, everything from genetics to forestry to ecology to structural physics, that you can really be in any of those fields and still call yourself an entomologist. So I really love that flexibility. I think a lot of people get into entomology because insects are our major competitors for our food, our space, and our health. And so a lot of people get into understanding insects and understanding their biologies and also understanding the diseases that they vector and carry. So that way we can help secure our food supply, we can help secure our homes, and we can help secure our health. And so I think a lot of people get into entomology for the betterment of the world, which is awesome. Mac also asks, how can you apply entomology lessons for people who aren't interested or those people who are scared of insects? And for me, this is not mashing bug facts down people's throats. It's not being like, hey, listen to bugs. Look how cool they are. You should like them. You shouldn't be afraid. It's about meeting people halfway. Uh, it's like everyone's gangster until the cockroach starts to fly. So everyone has a bug story, whether it was like their grandma, they found a weird bug, they have a weird picture of a bug on their phone, they have a story of some sort. So connect with them on that level. Also asking people what they think about bugs, they'll usually say we don't like bugs or bugs are weird or gross, but if you ask them if they like butterflies or dragonflies or fireflies or ladybugs, those for some reason get classified in a different part of people's brains, I don't really know why, but then they're like, oh yeah, I like those. And you're like, oh, well, those are insects. You can start talking to them about those insects that they've already decided that they liked to try and bridge that gap. And you'd be like, oh, well, you know, like ladybugs are actually beetles and they're not that different than these, uh, like, than these other beetles that do do this really cool thing. 
The other thing is to confront people's fears and see why they're afraid. So a good one is like spiders, because spiders can bite, but, but a lot of people don't understand that most spiders just don't bite for no reason and that most spider venom actually isn't that toxic. Just assuring people that spiders aren't aggressive, they don't bite you for no reason, most are not medically significantly venomous to people. Yeah, it'll hurt a little bit, but that's basically it. And it can be easily treated with just some antibiotic, like topical antibiotic. That's usually enough to ease many people's minds. Also just being calm around insects, like living your best truth, I find is also really effective. Like, yeah, sure, like Sally might not like insects, but she might see you holding them and picking them up and taking pictures of them. And maybe after, you know, four months of Sally seeing you do that, she might be like, oh, um, can I see what you're doing? Or what are you taking a picture of? Or like, why is this interesting? So, you know, be patient, meet people at the level that they are and make sure that you're catering your information in a way that one, they can understand and two, is relevant to their interests or to their fears. Our second question is from Dane, and he is asking, do observation skills come naturally as an entomologist or is it something that you have to work at? And it was something that I definitely had to work at. I remember in Australia, I was given a very specific assignment. It was actually one of my favorite assignments of my college career. Obviously, I still remember it. But basically, you had to look at urban wildlife. We were in Australia, so it was like some random birds. Um, and I picked uh, the water dragons, which are a type of lizard. But basically, you looked at this really common animal. So think of like a pigeon. It was like looking at a pigeon and imagining you were the first person ever to see it and describe it and you were going to write your findings to the queen. So you had to do a drawing of its morphology and its adaptations and why you think it had those adaptations. You had to think about what it was eating and why it was eating that and how it was eating those things. And it was really just like a week long sit down, look at your organism and think about why it's acting and behaving the way it is. So I really loved that assignment and it really made me start to think critically about behavior and adaptations. And with that being said, I have two pieces of advice from entomologists. The first is from Daniel Yavaneris and he says, collect, collect, collect and ID, sweep samples, light traps, pitfall traps, do it all. And on that same vein, Jim Horsfell says, my advice to anyone who wants to do entomology as a hobby or as a profession is buy a sweep net and other simple kits and get going. Natural history societies are also a good source of mentors and learning too. So if you want to get started on collecting or sweep netting, I have a video the, from a long time ago. You can see me as a baby. <laughs> Uh, up here so be sure to click that video and, and take a look at it if you're interested in collecting um, note that even if you do collecting you don't have to do physical samples you can just do photographs but regardless the idea behind this advice is look at the things in your backyard and when you try to identify them you are going to be looking at their morphologies because all of our identification for insects right now is based on the morphology of the insect. So if you find a weird cricket, for example, you know, it's gonna be asking you things like, what do the antennae look like? What do the segments look like? Does it have wings? Like what kind of legs does it have? And while you're looking at those identifying features, it's important for you to think about like, why does the insect have those features? In ecology, we talk about this all the time, form equals function. These random appendages, these like long antennae, short antennae, whatever, have an effect on the animal's biology and how it interacts with the world. So when you start with a morphology, it's a good base to just start asking questions. And this curiosity is going to get you so far in entomology because the more questions you can ask, the more doors it's going to open for research or job potentials or whatever. Being curious is such an important trait for being a scientist or an entomologist. On that same vein, Ollie8888 asks, uh, book suggestions for identification? And of course, like all questions, this is a little bit complicated. It depends on where you are and the level of entomology that you're at. And I also have another video kind of talking about identification resources and how to use them for different levels in your entomology status. It's linked up here in a card and it's also linked in the reference section. But the important thing is, 
any books that you get should be on your level. So if all you are is like, I don't even know what's outside, you know, starting with a field guide would be good all the way up to an insect key, which is the most specific and most scientific document to identify down to species level. Um, if you're looking at a field guide, which is what I recommend for beginners, there's a couple things that you're going to want to do. You're first going to want to make sure that that field guide is relevant to the area that you are living in. Or definitely don't get one like insects of Florida or Texas if you're living in Europe. So make sure that you get a field guide that is not only relevant to your area, but also but also relevant to the group or groups that you're interested in studying. So this is a book that I love and it's very broad. It is Insects and Arthropods of Tropical America. And as you may guess, this covers Central and South America. I love this field guide. It's very general. It doesn't have most of the things that I'm looking at, but it does get me pretty far down to like genus. Um, or family. So there's some weird families here that I never like really considered. But what I love about this field guide is it has all of these chunks where it just tells you about the biology of a certain group and goes kind of like a deep dive into that biology. So this is a pretty general field guide, but it definitely gets me started on many insects that are insect groups that I've found here in Ecuador. Another one that I really like, I'm in my quarantine location, so I don't have all of my books with me, so you'll see them on screen. Um, I have one that's out of print, unfortunately, which is the uh, Ecology of uh, Ecuadorian Butterflies, and I love that one. But it also shows you how limited field guides are because there are about 5,000 species of butterflies, and obviously this small book cannot cover all of them, so it just covers the common species. And you'll find that a lot in field guides. So if you're just looking for a general thing of like whatever is outside and probably what you're gonna find is common, a field guide is a great way to go. If you're like, I'm super interested in this small group of butterflies, or I'm super interested in this small group of mantises, you may need an insect key eventually down the line or you may need to find a forum where there are experts in that group that can help you identify. Another book that I have that I really like is Moths of Costa Rica. And, I, and even though I realize that I am in Ecuador and not in Costa Rica, many of the species or at least the genera that I would find on the western side of Ecuador are found in Costa Rica. And so I can still use that book, but I take it with a grain of salt. Like I don't expect every species. I tend to use it just to identify it down to genus, but that like 700 page book is just moths and nothing else. So it depends on where you are and it depends on how specific of a book that you want. Like there are books that are just dragonflies and damselflies of southeastern United States. So if you're interested in damselflies and dragonflies and happen to live in southeastern United States, that would be a really good one. It probably has a lot of species just specific to that area. So you're more likely to find what you've seen in that book than you would just for like insects of North America or even dragonflies of North America. With that being said, I asked a whole bunch of entomologists for their favorite field guide recommendations attached to their location. So in the description box, you are going to be able to find all of their suggestions. So you can pick one that is relevant to you and your interests. And Joe asks, what do you think is a typical path through post high school education? And the most typical path is going from uh, high school to university and then studying like some sort of biology. So biology, zoology, ecology, molecular, uh, molecular biology, genetics, evolution and development, etc. Like kind of majoring in one of those areas is the most common. And then going for your master's degree and then for your PhD, if you decide to go for both, I would do them at different schools. So you get like different environments and different networking opportunities and um, more things on your CV. That's always a good thing. So I would definitely recommend going, if you're gonna get your master's and your PhD to do them at two different schools. I stopped at my master's, but there are some people that just skip their master's and just go straight to a PhD. And there's some people that get both. And there's some people like me that just get a master's. If you are looking to become a professor, you will need to get a PhD. Then you are going to need to do a postdoc, which is basically like you did your PhD, but now you're gonna do more research in someone else's lab so you get more experience. Yeah, anyways, you're gonna postdoc one, two, or sometimes even three times in three different projects. And then you will become an assistant professor, 
a professor and then a tenured professor. So that's like pretty much the general trajectory. However, I am a self-made tour guide in Ecuador focused on entomology. So the traditional path is by no means the only path. So now we're going to talk about some schooling stuff in general. Ugh, I'm gonna drink some tea. Oh, tea. <laughs> Give this video a like so Nancy stays hydrated. <laughs> Anjo Illustration asks, how do I start? <laughs> I mean, if I really want to study at university. And so I have two expert entomologist responses. Airbnb says, which is like an amazing username, <laughs> says, stay curious and know that we all feel inadequate, hashtag imposter syndrome. I think that's so important. You're going to school because you don't know anything or you don't know all the things yet. Like if you knew all of the things, you wouldn't be in school, right? Like, so you should not feel bad if you feel dumb or you feel like you don't know enough or all those things. Like you're in school to learn. That's why you're there. I'm still in the school of life. I feel dumb all the time. And I just like read and read and read and sit in forums and read and sit in forums more. So just know that if you are feeling inadequate, like, Everyone feels like that at first. The important thing is just to start. So you can start with like collecting and IDing and all that kind of stuff, or you can start by just applying to a university. Um, Airbnb goes on to say, don't be afraid to ask experts for identification help and how to action projects at home. Especially if you're a high schooler and you're doing like science fair, things like that, or you want hands-on lab experience, just asking like, can you help me ID this? And you know, an expert doesn't necessarily have to be a professor. If you're gonna do like science fair project or kind of like get into that research route, it should be. But if you're just curious and want somewhere to start, just get into entomology groups and ask for help for identifications. Not just ask, what is this? But how do you know? How can you tell like what characteristics should I use to look at it? Would be a great place to start. Again, that video that I talked about that says like different resources, entomology groups are in there for how to use them as resources for identification if you need help. Um, Airbnb goes on to say there are plenty of resources if you look and species can be seasonal. So be sure to look at all times of the year. And that I think was most surprising to me in the tropics. I was like, it's the rainforest. Like, how many seasons can there be? But it's amazing the seasonality. Um, I get people all the time who are asking like, when's the best time to come? And I'm really like, what are you looking for? So April on the Western side, and I'm gonna speak for the Western side of Ecuador because that's the side that I'm most familiar with. But like the Western side of Ecuador, like our really great bug season is the end of March, beginning of April. The blue cicadas that I absolutely love only come out in April. like. January and February is great for big moths. Summer, like August and July, is really great for butterflies. So the seasonality is absolutely amazing. And even outside of the tropics, like there's bugs that only come out in the fall. There's bugs that only come out in the winter. You can see bumblebee queens in the spring. So just like get out and see what's around you. And then Rachel E. B. also has some great advice. And her advice is stay curious and keep asking questions and pursuing answers. And she goes on to say, I was slow to discover ecology and entomology because my interest of being outdoors and asking questions didn't align with what I envisioned as a scientist. There are many ways to hashtag dress like a scientist. And yes, I totally agree with this. I've talked to people and they're like, what do you do? And I'm like, oh, I'm an entomologist. And they're like, you don't, you don't look like an entomologist. I'm like, how many entomologists have you met? I'm probably the only one. Like, I'm sorry, I'm not some old guy, some old white guy in a lab coat, but like I'm an entomologist and this is what I look like. So. And I really hope that people aren't discouraged, like if they like makeup or they're not, they're like girly or if they're not girly and like reading or don't like reading or like video games or don't like video games or like hiking or don't like hiking. Like there is space in entomology for everybody. There are people who are in entomology who don't even like the outdoors. They prefer doing lab work and that's totally fine. There's people who hate lab work and prefer being outdoors. Like entomology does not have a face, does not have a class, does not have a race. So you look like and are an entomologist if you like bugs.
done. And so Darkened Enigma asks, what jobs or volunteer work are good to do while learning to become an entomologist and what provide skills that would be useful in a career? Thanks for all the content. And you're welcome, Darkened Enigma. I'm glad you're here, so yay. <laughs> Renato Guzman asks, what classes should one take in high school to prepare them for an entomology career? And I have some good advice from OSUC curator and she says, don't be a one trick pony, never stop learning, expect changes and prepare for them. And I think that is definitely the best advice. Having said like really kind of any experience that you can get in the sciences is gonna be so helpful. Research opportunities, lab work opportunities, a lot of these you can get as an undergraduate. If you are thinking about going to get a master's or, or going to grad school, you can work in labs as a freshman in undergrad and sometimes you can even get paid for it. But having that experience is so useful. Like obviously if you're interested in biology, you should probably focus on biology labs. But even if you're working like with reptiles and eventually you want to transfer over to insects, like that having that lab experience is still going to be so helpful. Having outreach experience, so you understand how to talk to people about your science is going to be so helpful. Classes, the more general the classes you can have and the more of them, the, the better it's going to be for you. Take a genetics class, take a molecular biology class, take an ecology class. Even if you think like, I'm an ecologist, I'm never going to study genetics. That's what I thought. And I'm glad I had a genetics class under my belt because my first research project was gut endosymbionts of aphids. So it was technically ecology because we're talking about like endosymbionts and gut flora of, of aphids, but I had to do a lot of molecular work and a lot of genetic work as well. So like I had to understand PCR and I had to make my own primers and I had to sequence DNA and understand it and, 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 and use those programs and, 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 and. So even if you have experience in an area that's maybe not exactly what you want to go into, having that experience is going to be so helpful and is going to look good on resumes and CVs and applications. And then on that same vein, <laughs> I have two questions that are kind of on the same, same wavelength. Blue Morpho 86 says, how good at math you have to be? <laughs> math is not my friend. And Renato Guzman says, sorry for this spam, but this is my final question. Do you have to be good at math to be an entomologist? Because I suck at it, crying face. I also suck at math. So this would kind of also go with like, what classes should you take to prepare? And definitely a statistics class because you don't necessarily need to be good at math, but you do need to understand how to analyze whatever data from your research project that you are getting. So you need to know what kind of tests to run on that data and how to run them and what the numbers mean that the computer is spitting out. So having a good statistical base and starting in high school or in college is going to be so important for you when you're doing your research and having that on your resume or on your application is going to be gold. Um, the, so in some cases you can pay someone when you're doing your master's or PhD research to run your statistical work for you, but you definitely don't want to do that. Like you're the one who did the experiment and you're the one who knows like what you did. So you want to be the one that's interpreting your data. There is an amazing book, which I'll also link in the description reference section below, which is statistics for the terrified biologist. And it runs through some of the statistical tests that you're most likely to run into as a biologist and what tests you want to use in what situation and why and what the results are telling you and what those numbers are telling you. So um, statistics is definitely one that you're gonna have to use and learn about even if you don't like it, but it's not like straight up math either. Like the computer's gonna do all the math for you and you don't have to do the math. On that note, also programming. So our most statistical analysis is done in a program called R, which is notoriously difficult to program and learn and all that stuff. So if you can take an R class, do. If you can learn how to program, definitely do. Also another program that you'll probably want to learn if you're doing ecology stuff is ArcGIS. It is the standard, it's like, I don't know, it's like the Adobe Photoshop of science and ecology is ArcGIS um, and any GIS program. So definitely take a class on that. Even if it's not offered at your school, if it's something that you know, like I wanna get into ecology and mapping and spatial mapping and all that stuff, 
then there are classes online that you can take for how to learn to use GIS and like just having that on your resume or your application, even for some um, field research jobs is going to be so helpful. So like, not only can I take the data and I understand how to do field research, but I can also map it out using this complicated program. There we are for video number one. So next time I'm gonna be talking all about my tips and tricks for grad school because I got two questions on graduate school. So you will be getting all about like my mistakes that I made when picking a grad school, why I thought they were mistakes and what I would have done differently. So if that sounds interesting to you, that will be next week. Thank you all so much for submitting your questions. They were so intelligent and so interesting. And I'm really happy to impart not only my experience, but also the experience of other entomologists. Be sure to check the reference section for all of those amazing goodies that I have put and sprinkled in there for you all. You're welcome. <laughs> And I am so excited to see you next week. Remember, if you have any questions at any point, you can message them to me on my social medias or here on YouTube as well. And I'm so happy to answer them and help you navigate the wild world of entomology. All right, my love bugs. I will see you all next week. Bye.